Amen. It's good to see you. Glad to be here. I tell you what, it feels a lot better in here than it does outside, doesn't it? And I thank the Lord for that. People say, well, I tell you what, I like them old-timey days. I go back to the old-timey days. Well, there are some things in old-timey days I like and appreciate it, but I'm glad for air conditioning, aren't you? And central heat and air, that's a real blessing. All right, let's pray. And then we're going to sing number 457, 457. And then uh, let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for another opportunity to be in the house of God. And it's my prayer, dear Lord, that as we gather here, we'll not waste this opportunity. And God, that we'll take advantage of once again uh, fellowshipping with you and one with another. And singing, praising God, hearing the word of God preached. So, Lord, please help us again today. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen and amen. 457, everybody's standing and singing. 457. Seven, four seventy seven. We'll sing the first, second, and last of the solid rock. Amen. Four seventy seven. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I You can be. 
be seated. All right. Well, I'm glad it's been a good afternoon. We had a good time today at our house. Our kids and grandkids were there. We enjoyed each other's company. It's always good to have kids come back home. Amen. And uh, I don't know about you, but when ours get together, it's a noisy place. It's a good noise, okay? And I just, I used to be the ringleader of the noise, but now I have to take a back seat to to the loud mouths in the family. And, uh, but it was a great time. Hope you did that too. And uh, uh, if you didn't get one of those little uh, pamphlet books this morning, you fellas can be sure to get one tonight. Hope you'll read it. Just don't take it home. Just throw it away. Read that, read it. And ladies, I hope you've read yours too. And uh, it's good reading. And, uh, and uh, also, now next Sunday, we'll be uh, uh, starting revival services with uh, Brother Beckham. Uh, he and his wife will be here uh, from Sunday through Wednesday. And uh, I'm praying that God will send something from heaven that will help us and revive, help us get revived. I'll be saying more about that tonight in my message about revival. And, of course, truly, uh, our church needs revival. Our our county needs revival. We need revival all over the place. You know that. And I don't know if a church in the country doesn't need revival. Amen. I don't know if a family that doesn't re- need revival. So anyway, uh, don't forget that. Pray for it. We'll be getting some uh, some flyers done up by Wednesday night and give them to you. That way you can have them. And I hope you just won't get get some and just take them home, leave in your car. I hope you'll uh, uh, take them out, visit, call people. And revival this week, which come out and be with us, and give them a cordial invitation, okay? And uh, I'll say more about that also in my message today. All right. But anyway, don't forget those days coming up. And also uh, next Sunday we'll have a, a, a sign up list for Bible school workers. Uh, our theme this year is down by the riverside. And what we're going to do in Bible school this year is we're going to visit some of the uh, great rivers in the Bible and what happened at that place. And use that as a way to help our our kids and young folks enjoy that. And of course, we'll have some every day will be a special day. And we're having to do something a little bit different this year. I uh, didn't plan it this way, but we had to alternate a little bit. We're going Monday through Thursday night. As most of you know, Brother Willis and his church has that uh, summer spectacular at their church on Friday and Saturday. And I always try to go to that. And uh, they've been such a good friend of ours and supporter of our camp meeting. I'd hate not to be do the same thing for them. Of course. It's a good meeting. It's worthy of that. And so we'll be going Monday through Thursday night for Bible school. And we'll be over there on that Friday and Saturday, Lord willing. Okay? But anyway, uh, we'll be having that sign-up list on next Sunday. Might have it out by Wednesday night. So we're going to need some Bible school workers, okay? Craft workers. We're going to need some uh, uh, teachers in the younger classes. And I'll also need some help in here and also some help in the kitchen. All right? But anyway, right now the choir is going to sing. Listen carefully. I pray it will bless your heart and encourage you.
Let's stand up and speak to each other. Amen. seats. Amen. Amen. Okay. Praise the Lord. I'm glad it's well with my soul, aren't you? All right. Well, now somebody gave me gave a little thing this morning for the memory thing, but didn't they didn't put their name to it. They said one of my one of my uh, good memories is about when we had the uh, the uh, uh, Operation Rescue at Hampton Street. Our church along with Faith Baptist we joined together, but didn't sign it. So, anyway, whoever wrote that, need to give me your name so I can put it to it, okay? All right? Okay. Uh, this morning, after church was over, I mentioned Brother Danny Hodge on the way out. He said, preacher, he said, I do have a good memory. I think he said he was in kindergarten or first grade. Miss Blenda Jones was his teacher. said, uh, uh, ask him to uh, pray or say the blessing or something. And he, he just didn't. He just started crying. So she sent him to the office. She said, you need to go to the office. Well, that's me. You need to go to the principal's office. So he thought he was in trouble. So he came to the principal's office, and I said, what happened? He said, you took me to your house and gave me an ice cream sandwich. We ate ice cream. And he said, I've your, been your friend ever since. <laughs> and that's, now, I would have never remembered that. And uh, he said, I thought I was in trouble. Instead of getting in trouble, I got a treat. And uh, he didn't say this, but I think in the back of my mind, he's thinking, not praying paid off. But, okay. Uh, now, this one here is a pretty good one. I won't, I won't read the person's name, but it, it says, Pastor Baker, uh, I sure did need that message this morning. Boy, I'm glad God knows best. I've been having an awful time at work for the past three years because I've tried to do what the Bible says, uh, live right and obey God. I've and I've had to let someone cuss me out and stand there and take it. And I really wanted to knock the head off. <laughs> but the night before you preached on losing your testimony by your reactions and, and how people are watching you. So I, I cried. And before I left, I apologized to the person and, and I did nothing. But this week they went too far. Anyway, shoot, I won't read the whole thing. Said that as a result of them doing that, and I finally had to confront them face to face. And the boss man brought them before me, and I told them I could not work in a place where two faced people work, and that I would be praying for them. But I quit and got me a new job. <laughs> <laughs> hey, preaching helped out. Okay, and. Uh, it says, I gave my notice and told them I wouldn't work with knowing who my enemies are, but I know the devil's doing it because two weeks ago, for the first time, I got, I got them praying in church. I got them praying at work. So nothing more than the devil fighting. 
Thank you for being the preacher God wants you to be. Amen. All right. That's pretty good, isn't it? Well, we go from that. Let me put it back in there. Okay. All right. We go from that to this. It's got the clouds and the sun shining and the beams off of it. It's got a little fence with flowers beside the fence, a little doggy behind the fence. And on the hillsides, a little house looks like. And it says, I love you, uh, Alexis uh, uh, Manus. Amen. And uh, 19, uh, 2015. That's good, isn't it? And she drew real good. Here's one from Danny Farrell. I saw you come in, but then I thought about Brother Strobel. Uh, he's got his little thing. You and him want to have a race. <laughs> Throw Brother Barry in there, and we'll have a good one. Amen. Pastor Baker, thank you for your ongoing friendship, support, and leadership. Uh, the longer I'm saved, the more I realize some of what you put up with <laughs> for the cause of Christ. And he's married, okay? <laughs> and it humbles me to think that I've got a long way to go to catch up to your example of steadfastness, patience, and long-suffering. And he, he says a few things else. I won't read that. But he said, he said that, that is, I covet your prayers for my daughters and mother. I look forward to returning in time to help get ready for a camp meeting. And so then he signed it and put Ecclesiastes 9, 13 through 17. So that's, that's, that's stuff I keep. And, uh, and so there's all kind of stuff over here. I, I sort of go through and, and some of it's, you know, just simple stuff. You know, just simple stuff, but simple stuff means a lot. Amen. And uh, so if you've got a good memory, please write it down, sign your name to it, and, and, and give some detail. And I've already got about six or seven men. Irene turned a good one in. I mean, I, I had somewhat forgotten about that, Irene. Amen. Her mother was coming, and one day I was talking to her, and there was a golfer named Chichi Rodriguez, and I used that without not realizing what Chichi means. Okay? All right. And if you don't know, Irene will tell you after church. Her mother said, oh, Pastor Becker, don't you do, don't do that. Don't you shouldn't use that. That's some even and outside of a man's name, you know, it's like Polish and Polish. All depends on how you, what context you use it in. So I use it in the wrong context. And uh, you say, Well, tell us the rest of the story. I not Irene will have to tell you what it means. Okay? I knew what it means because I've never done that again. <laughs> That is a good memory. All right. Well, anyway, if you've got one, please write it down. Folks would love to hear. And it doesn't have to even, it can involve something else. Okay? Just like Kathy's this morning was her wedding day. And what all happened with that wedding day. So it could be a good memory of something happened just in Sunday school or in the choir or camp meeting or just anything. Write it down. Turn it in. We want to compile it into a, a good little book it. Booklet, okay? All right. Well, let's have another good song, okay? And then uh, we'll uh, sing this one and another in just a few minutes. All right. Okay? All right. All right. You can remain seated on this one then. Turn to page 488. 488. There's a new name and glory. Amen. Right. Amen. 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 <laughs> I was once a sinner, but I came harder to receive from And I found that he always kept his word. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. And the white road angels sing the story. A sinner has come home. But well, there's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Oh, yes, it's And 
Satan, save my grace. Oh, the joy that came to my soul. Now I am forgiven, and I know by the blood I am. songs like that really help me it might not do much for you but it helps me because I think about the song the words that are in the song I think about my name written down aren't you glad that ought to excite you there's a new name written down in glory and it's mine oh yeah there's a new name written down in glory and it's mine oh yes it's mine amen it's written back 1969 got written down amen looking forward to that day and uh we get to heaven might have to visit that book and see see where god's got it in that book and brother whitman told a fellow one time called here who had the idea you could lose your salvation brother whitman told a fellow he said yeah i believe in eternal security god wrote your name down didn't write it down in pencil did not write it down in pencils in pencil you could erase it but your name's written down it's not erasable it's there forever now, uh, this evening, we're going to take our other's offering for a family. Uh, I cannot remember their name. All I know is that they, I think they attend uh, the Faith Baptist Church. Their home burnt down. Their house burnt down. Not their home. Their house burnt down. Lost absolutely everything that they had. And so uh, they're needing some help financially, needing some help with other things. And I believe the Faith Baptist Church is sort of, helping them with this and there's an account I think at the bank and so to help them out financially does uh, anybody know their name I can't remember huh anybody it's pretty bad taking off somebody don't know their name and uh, but I saw it on Miss Baker's Facebook and then I got a, I got a phone call and I knew about it and uh, so we want to help them out amen and uh, what better thing you could do to help somebody whose uh, home is burnt down, house is burnt down, they got kids, lost all their furniture, all their clothes, everything. And so we want to be a part of that, help them out. So let's get a good offering tonight, and I'll sure find out more about the, uh, uh, they, they might can use something else. Maybe you got something they can use, furniture, bed linen, towels, and clothes for the kids, things like that. And so uh, I remember I asked my mom and them one time, I said, uh, Mom, why don't we have any pictures of you and Daddy when y'all first got married and the kids? She said, well, uh, when, when my mother was expecting me, the house caught on fire. And my mom and Daddy lost all the pictures, all the things that they had at their wedding and things like that, and, and my brothers and sisters. And so uh, a fire can destroy a lot of things materialistically. Boy, I'm sure glad the folks got out alive. You know that? You can always replace a piece of furniture and some clothing, but you can't replace people. And so anyway, we will be a help to them, be a blessing to them, and I know it will be. Okay, so we're going to stand our feet one more time and sing a couple of verses and receive tonight's others off. Amen. All right, let's all stand, turn to page 495. 495, we'll sing the first and last. Brethren, we have met to worship. Amen. There you go. There you go. That's a good <laughs>
tonight. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful tonight that we can once again be uh, somewhat of a help to this dear family, Lord, who had a house fire, and Lord, all their earthly possessions were gone in just a few moments. And Lord, we're so thankful that no life was lost, and Lord, that uh, you'll bless them and help them as they recover from this. God, I pray you'll help us tonight to be a blessing to them and a help to them in this offering. And Lord, they'll know, uh, Lord, that uh, we care. And Lord, it's at times like this, it's good to have friends and neighbors. So Lord, I pray, and I know you will come to their rescue, that many others, Lord, have already joined in and no doubt done, done some, uh, some things, dear God, that will help assist this family. Lord, I think that we can be a small blessing now. In thy name we pray. Amen. up here to do his thing. Okay. You got that, Brother Tommy? <laughs> that family's name is the Long family, Tracy Long. And so I appreciate that help. Okay. All right, let's get our Bibles out this evening and turn to the book of Isaiah chapter 50, 57. Isaiah chapter 57. And uh, with revival days coming up, I've asked the Lord to help me, direct me with some uh, messages that will uh, help us to get ready. And uh, so the Lord has directed us and that uh, helped us in that direction tonight. Can you hear me okay? Everybody can hear me okay in the back? Everybody can hear me okay. Isaiah chapter 57, I'm going to read verse 15. Isaiah 57, 15. For thus saith the high and lofty one. You notice that word one is capitalized as speaking of God. The high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. You ought to underline that statement. God is the inhabitor of eternity. Amen. Amen. Somebody said, where'd God come from? I said, I don't know. He's always been, always will be. And so he is the inhabitor of eternity, whose name is holy. Aren't you glad you got a holy God? Amen. Amen. He said, I dwell in the high and holy place with him that is of a contrite 
and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Now, there are some key thoughts in here, key statements in here. First of all, we see uh, some more about our God. He's the one who inhabits eternity. He's been in eternity past. When there, uh, uh, so I said, when, when did God begin? I don't know. Here's why. If God had a beginning, then he'd have to have an end. And since God had no beginning, he has no end. Well, the banker, that's hard to believe. That's why you do it by faith. Or you listen to him, you do it by faith. And so he inhabits eternity and his name is holy. That word holy carries more to it than we give, give a record, uh, uh, honor to. His name is holy, which means he's perfect. There's no, there's no flaw in him. There's no, nothing wrong with him. He's a perfect God, amen. And then his notice says, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Now, when I think about the word revival, and we see it twice here in this passage, the word itself is very intriguing, the word revive. The word vive by itself means not in use. But when you look at the word and how we depict it today, what the Bible says, uh, uh, vively, it means in a lively manner, or vividly, with life and strength, with brightness. In other words, uh, with God in you and God on your side, side he, can, he can give you life. He can give you strength and vitality in a lively manner. In other words, when you get saved, when I got saved, we were regened. We were reborn. In other words, we were dead in sins and we were uh, alienated from God and there's nothing good in us. We were dead without hope, without God. But God came to us and God saved us. And when God saved us, we became born again. We became regened. So we got life in us. Amen. Now what happens is people get saved and they uh, start out real good. And boy, they're excited. They're thrilled. And, and they're just wanting to live for God. And their life has been changed. Now, I don't know about you, but that's what happened to me. Now, I know that every salvation experience is not going to be exactly like the Apostle Paul or exactly like mine, but I will say there are some similarities to most people who get saved, and these similarities really point that person has been saved. One is your life changes. Amen? It changes on the inside, and it changes on the outside. Another thing is, is that salvation is accompanied with joy. Are you listening to me? Salvation is accompanied with joy. Joy comes in your life. I've never known anybody who has gotten saved, really gotten saved, whose life didn't change in, in, in many, many ways, and who did not possess some joy in their life. In other words, they went from being sad and mad to happy and glad. Amen? Now, it doesn't mean their life was going to be without sorrow and heartache. It just means something happened to them. When I got saved, now before I got saved, I was a happy young man. I really was. But after I got saved, that happiness that I had was turned to joy. Are you listening? And so, boy, I was excited. I was thrilled. And I uh, loved going to church and, and all this uh, so much because I'd got regened. I'd got, I'd got vibed up, you might say. And then uh, people, after they get saved and, and uh, time moves along, sometimes it's, uh, it happens, and many times it happens, it seems like that fire, that zeal, that enthusiasm begins to wane off. Next thing you know, that individual, that saved person is not doing anything for God. The joy of the Lord that was their strength has departed uh, they neglect to be in church. The thrill of, of hearing the choir sing, the thrill of hearing the word of God preached diminishes. And if something is not done, they gradually just die up and dry up. 
Mm. Revive. The word revive, it means to give, give life to that which is dead or dying. Huh? When you look around most churches in this day and time, and you realize, how do you know revival is needed, Brother Baker? Look at churches today. I mean, today the church is in the recreation business, not the revival business. Amen? They're in the having a good time business and not so much living for God business. Instead of living holy, they won't live like every day's a holiday. Are you listening? Psalm 85, 6 says this. Wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? And so tonight I want to talk to you on this thought. Lord, send revival. Lord, send revival. Listen now, revival, listen to this very closely. Revival is a returning event. Revival is a returning event in your life, in my life. A returning. Now, how do I know that? Second Chronicles 7, 14. You know that verse. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and for, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Now when you break that verse down, now remember my statement, revival is nothing more than a returning event in a Christian's life. In other words, they're no longer what they used to be. They're no longer active like they used to be. They used to love to come to church and now they don't care if they come or not. They used to love to give and now giving is far from them. They used to love to live for God and, and invite folks to church and, and see people say, but not anymore, they don't care. And so it's a returning. Now, it's plainly right in front of you. 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. He said, if my people, which are called by my name, so... Revival is not for the lost. <laughs> I said revival is not for the lost. The revival is for God's people. Those that are called by his name. Now notice the steps. He said, he said, uh, shall humble themselves. That's number one. Pray, that's number two. And seek my face, that's number three. You got it? The first three things, humility, prayer, and seeking God's face. In other words, the Bible makes it plain that these three things spell this one statement. Revival is, is a returning of God's people to fellowship and communion with him. It's a returning to you and I humbling ourselves in prayer and seeking God's face. That is the first step to revival. It is a returning. A returning. Now, uh, as I ponder this message, boy, the Holy Spirit really, really dealt with me personally in this message. So I'm telling you, boy, <laughs> and if you don't get it, I get it. I mean, if you don't need it, I need it, okay? Humility, prayer, seeking God. And all three of these have to do with our fellowship with God, our communion with Him. Now, you know Brother Beckham, he is, if there, his, his main thrust in the ministry is the people of God uh, spending time every day communing with God in prayer and supplication. That's his main thrust, okay? First three things. Now, watch this. The fourth thing he mentioned was to turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear, I will forgive, and I will heal. So God says here, if you will return to me, if you will get back into a, 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 a humble spirit and pray and seek my face, he said, if you'll do those things, that will enable you to turn from your wicked ways. And when that happens, I will hear from heaven, and not only will I hear, I will forgive and I will heal. In other words, God says, 
if your uh, revival will come when my people get back in communion with me and when that happens, uh, you'll see yourself as you really are and then you'll turn from your wicked ways and then I'll hear from heaven and I'll hear your land. So think about that. God says that's the formula for it. Now, sometimes I think we get it backwards. Now, I know the importance, I know the dire importance of turning from sin and getting repenting and getting right with God as a saved person. But that's not the formula. That's not the first step. Now you would think it would. He doesn't say if my people will turn from their wicked ways first. Does he say that? He does. That's the fourth thing on the list. He said the first three things have to do with your relationship with me. That's what God says. God is saying, if you if you if you get right with me, and I become the center of your life, and you seek me with all your heart, you know what will happen? It will be no hard thing for God's people to then repent of their sins. You can't love two masters, can you? Isn't that what the Bible says? And so when God's people are, are connected back up with God again in fellowship and communion, the things of this world will lose their, will lose their limelight. And it'll be easy to turn from your wicked ways. Now, I know that we ought to return from our wicked ways. I understand. And we'll repent of our sins. But that's not near as important as having communion with God every day. Every day. Now, boy, hmm, fellowship. Listen, fellowship will lead to fellowship. You got it? Our fellowship with the Heavenly Father, and He is our Heavenly Father, our, our daily fellowship and communion with him will, will develop in us a fellowship, which means that if we are in communion with him every day and he is the, he, he is the joy of our life, guess what? We'll follow him day by day, which means as we follow him, since he is holy, it says he is holy, he will lead us in the paths of righteousness which will mean that we'll not be as messed up as we were, we'll not be in sin like we were, and so our daily fellowship with God as we commune with him and seek his face and pray and ask God will develop us inwardly. You know what will happen? And then God will say, then you'll repent. So you follow, listen, you follow the one in your fellowship and the one, here's what it says, you follow the one you fellowship with the most. You got that? You follow the one that you fellowship with the most. So if you fellowship with God each day, seeking his face, praying to him, that's the one you'll follow. But hear me, if you do not have a daily time of communion and fellowship with God in prayer, in Bible reading, you will not turn from your wicked ways. You will not turn from your wicked ways. Now think about this. Do you know it's a sin not to pray? Now listen to this. Do you know it's a sin not to fellowship with God? It's wicked. We think of wickedness as doing something. It's something we do. It's wicked. It's wicked when you don't fellowship with God. It's wicked when your motives aren't right. That's why in Matthew chapter uh, uh, chapter seven, Jesus talked about them people who say, "Well, you know, I did this in your name, and I did this in your name, and did this in your name." And He says, "Depart me, ye workers of what iniquity." All all the good they were doing was for the uh, wrong reason. And God said, it was wicked in my eyes. And so God looks down from heaven today. You know what's breaking his heart? You know what's the one thing that, that, is, that, is, that is troubling him? It's not so much what you are doing or we're not doing. It's what we're not doing. It's not so much what we are doing as it is what we're not doing. And what are we not doing? We're not 
We're not humbling ourselves and we're not seeking his face and we're not praying. And that's the number one thing on God's list. He hungers and craves for our fellowship and our communion. And the one thing he desires most, he's getting least of. Because he knows, he knows that if we will, if we'll come to him each day and commune with him and he with us in our prayer time and Bible reading and Bible study, he knows when that happens, hey, our wicked ways will not be as wicked. Our life will be more consecrated and dedicated to him. And by the way, once you do those three things, then he says, I will hear your prayers and I will answer you know how a lot of saved people don't get answered prayer? It's not because of their wicked ways. It's because they're not communion with God. Now, sin, 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 sin will keep your prayers from getting answered. But the greatest sin is for a saved person, it's not what you're doing. It's not, it's what you're not doing. You're not fellowshipping with God each day. Now, think about this. Lord, sin, revival. Why, why are we not seeing revival? Well, number one, listen, God's people don't care. Woo! This is not a shout message, is it? I said God's people don't care. And that's an inward condition. They don't care. They just don't care. An inward condition. He talked to here in our scripture about, about the, uh, uh, your spirit, and your heart. God's people do not have a heart for God, it seems like. Now, you have, you have to judge yourself. Sermons like this, I have nobody in mind except myself, okay? And so when I'm preaching this, you're saying, who's he preaching to? I'm preaching to you. That's what I'm preaching to. Every one of you. I can't, I'm not preaching those who are not here. I'm preaching those who are here. You're probably thinking, well, those who are not here need it more than me. That might be so. Okay? But that's being heading high-minded. So you do need it. God's people don't care. It's an inward condition. Isaiah 57, 15 says, Re- revive. Uh, uh, it says, revive. What we just read there in our, in our verse Revive the spirit of the humble. Revive the heart of the contrite. In other words, revival is needed because God's people don't have a heart for God. They don't have a spirit for God. Now, you've got to understand this. If you've got a spirit for people and you've got a spirit For others, that's commendable. But that's not the best. Having a heart for others is wonderful. We need that. And I think think that we're, as a church family, I believe we're good at that. But the greatest measure of a church is their heart for God. Would you not say amen to that? Because the Bible says we're to love him with all our what? Heart, soul, mind, strength, spirit. We're to love him supremely. And oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. I'm telling you, sometimes we sing that and it's the biggest lie that come out of our mouth. I'll tell you why we need revival because God's people don't care. Revival must start inwardly. Revival is not you turning from sin. Revival is not you laying down your cigarettes or your beer bottle or or whatever it may be. That's not, revival is when you return to a fellowship with him. That is the greatest step toward revival. It's when God's people humble themselves in his presence and pray and seek his face. That is the beginning of revival. That will help you turn from your wicked ways. And so the first thing, Lord, send revival. Why, Lord? Because God's people don't care. Now, hear me, hear me well. There are some who really care. There are not many. There are not many. There's always been a few. I look back over history and hear about uh, revivals even today and uh, centuries gone by. 
And many revivals have been started by young folks getting a heart for God. You got that? Getting a heart for God. And sometimes revival starts and comes because, because older people get a heart for God. I'm telling you, revival, revival, I guarantee revival will come. God will revive his people if his people return to him. Now listen, Brother Tommy, God's not looking for a big crowd to do that. He's not looking for a, a multitude because he knows it won't happen. God is looking for just a remnant. 12, 15, 10, 7. God's looking for that, that, those people who say, God, I want revival. I want you more than anything in my life. I want you to run my life, control my life. Every, teen, every saved teenager needs to pray that. Every young adult, every middle-aged adult, every grandparent, every great-grandparent, from the youngest to the oldest, hey, God is looking for some people who will say, Lord, let it start in me. Let it start in me. Revival is not getting a renowned preacher in. Revival is not, is not so much the choir singing the very best it can sing. Revival is not getting a big crowd here. Revival will begin. Revival will start and do something when God's people return to him. Revival is a returning. It is God's people. And so God's people, it seems like today, from what I see, just don't care. They don't care about God. They don't care about the church. Now, they'll tell you, I love the church, and I love Jesus, and I love this. Those are just vain words. Those words carry no meat to it whatsoever. Amen. If I love my wife, I'm going to care about her. Amen. Amen. I love my children. I'm going to care about them. I'm going to spend time. Hey, I love my wife. Ask her. I spend time with her. If my if our wife, my wife and I go off sometimes, we'll go out to eat somewhere, travel somewhere, just you know, together. We seldom have the radio on. We seldom listen to any music. You know why? We're talking to each other. I'm threatening to kick her out the door, and she says, "I dare you." And we, in other words, we enjoy each other's company. We we. We, we don't talk about people. We don't, we don't, unless it's good. Amen. And uh, she said, uh, uh, give me a hint. Who won the man of the year? I said, is a man. She said, I know that. And, uh, but we talk. And, and I enjoy being with my wife. Are you listening to me? I enjoy being with my children. I enjoy their, their company. And you do too. Don't you enjoy that? Well, when's the last time you spent time with your heavenly father? How often do you spend time with him? Lay in bed all day, never read your Bible. It is no wonder our churches are dead. It is no wonder we're not seeing people saved because God's people don't care. Number two. God, Lord, send revival. Why? Number one, God's people. Secondly, God's people don't call. They don't call. In other words, that first one don't care. That's an inward condition. God's people don't call. That's an upward condition. In other words, they do not pray. They don't call on God. They don't look to God. It's almost like, God, we don't need you unless it's an extreme emergency. God, we don't, we're not going to call on you until it gets really, really bad. Listen, prayer is more than, more than just you calling on God. And yeah, prayer is asking. But your communion and fellowship goes beyond that. When you're, when you're in his presence, when you're communing to him and him to you, hey, it's by and through the Holy Spirit and the word of God. It's not you like the charismatic say. It's not you speaking in another tongue. God understands English pretty good. Amen? But it's you talking to him and letting him talk to you and reading the word of God and not being in a hurry. Boy, I got 20 minutes, Lord. I got to hurry up. I got to go to work. 
Oh, Lord, I got it. Hey, when's the last time you put down a magazine or a book or cut your computer off and cut your television off and spent time alone with God? And so they don't care. They, don't, uh, they just don't care. They don't call on God. Here's the question. How much do you really pray? I cannot answer that for you. You'll have to answer that for yourself. But if somebody were to tag along with you and keep a record of your prayer time, what would they tally up? If somebody just followed you and wrote down not, not, uh, not what you prayed, but how long you prayed, what would it be? What would it be? How many hours would it be or how many minutes would it be? And he said, and God said, if you'll humble yourself. You see, whenever you come into God's presence with the right spirit, you will come humbly. You will not ever go into God's presence arrogant, head in high mind. Now, you can come boldly to the throne of grace. Father, I'm here. I'm glad you're my father. I'm glad, I'm glad I belong to you. Father, thank you. And boy, you can, you can praise him and you can thank him. But when you come into his presence, his presence will humble you. You don't humble yourself. You get in his presence, you'll be humbled. Yeah? You really will. There's been times in my life that I've been around certain Christians who had it just something about them that I felt humbled in their presence. You ever been there? It's just something about them that just stood out, the power and presence of God, and it humbled you. In other words, you just sort of sat there and said, wow. When you come into God's presence, when you call upon him and you pray and spend, and it, will, it will change your life. Listen, how much time do you spend with the Father in heaven? How much? God's people just don't call on him. Listen, you and the Holy Spirit with the Father, that's pretty good, isn't it? I said, you and the Holy Spirit. Now, here's why it's so important. That when you pray, you pray this way. You have the Holy Spirit to accompany you. Now, why is that so important? Because the Holy Spirit is God, and he knows the heart of the Father. So when you come into his presence... The Holy Spirit will enable you to pray right. The Holy Spirit will enable you to pray correctly. It will not be repetitious words. You'll be praying in the Spirit. Not in unknown tongues. You'll be praying in the Spirit, which means that your prayer, your communion will be elevated and proclamated by the Holy Spirit. And there will be times in your life, you've been through this, that when something in your life is just burdening you down and troubling you, and you, you, you go to God in prayer, Brother Tommy, and you don't know what to say, and you don't know what to pray, Holy Spirit does it for you. Isn't that wonderful? The Holy Spirit is our prayer partner. The Holy Spirit is our, is our prayer maker. And so it's so important that we spend time with God every day. Upward, upward. Lift up your head, lift up your heart in prayer and supplication, honoring your heavenly father, glorify him in your life and spending time. Listen, don't be in a hurry. Don't be in a hurry. Do you know what? If you spend time with a, if you if you spend time with the heavenly Father in one hour a day, be the greatest hour of your whole day. If it's just an hour, Amen. Somebody says, "Boy, we had a great service at church." And here's what they'll say: The Lord showed up. Now I like that. Don't you like it when the Lord shows up? Well, let me ask you a question. Suppose He showed up in your in your prayer closet. Suppose he showed up in your daily fellowship with him. You see, 
generation or two ago, God's people were hooked up to him every day. When they came to church, they were still hooked up. They came to church expecting God to show up. But now, the modern day church comes to church and saying, well, we hope he shows up. You know why? Because their daily living has nothing to do with him. They just don't care. And when you don't care, you won't call on him unless it's extreme emergency. All right, Lord, I got a tragedy in my life. Let's take him, let's get the spare tire out. And that's all God's used for sometimes. Listen to this. Sadly, talking about you and the Holy Spirit with the Father. Sadly, many saved people lie about the Holy Spirit. They say, well, I've been praying and God led me this direction. The Holy Spirit led me. I've heard that, I bet you, I've heard it hundreds of times. Why you do it? Well, the Holy Spirit led me. Really? Now, I'm not a discerner of that, but I want to say this. If you ever use the Holy Spirit just to have your way, that's horrible. You, hey, you'd be better off saying, well, I just did it. This is my decision. Do not attribute the Holy Spirit for a decision you made. Okay, now here's, here's why I say that. When you really and truly are devoted to him and you spend time with him and there's a communion there and you got the word of God, I'm telling you, listen to me now, you will make less and less and less mistakes. Your decisions will be more right on point than ever before because I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit and the word of God and the heavenly father knows how to direct your paths. But when you're in the deciding business, it ain't, hey, the Bible says don't lean to your own understanding, but acknowledge him. Amen? So, hey, uh, uh, going to God for five minutes? All right, now, Lord, help me. I got a lot to do today, and I got a lot of decisions to make. And so, Lord, would you help me? And uh, you, you, know, you know my heart. Amen? <laughs> and God says, God says, what? What did I just hear? You know my heart. Yeah, God said, I know your heart. Your heart's not in this. You see, God knows when your heart's in it. You know why we need revival? Because today, the church is full of people who have no heart for God. Whew. Boy. Prayer is... Prayer is you and God alone together. Prayer is you and the Heavenly Father alone together. It's not necessarily you and your wife or a husband. It's not, it's not you having family devotions. That's not what I'm talking about. It is you, you spending time alone with God. It is you and Him together. It's you and Him communing, Him enlightening you, Him talking to you, and you talking to Him. I'm telling you, it's you and God together. That's what this is all about. Revival. Lord, we need revival. God said, I'll send it. It's just as soon as you return to me, I'll hear your prayers, and you'll be able to turn from your wicked ways. Somebody said, boy, I sure wish I could quit this sinning. I sure wish I could give up this pornography. I sure wish I could lay this down. I got news for you. you all that could be done if you just spend time with him. You know why? Because the human man, the, the mortal man, does not, have, does not have the strength, does not have the desire to quit sinning. Well, I beg God and I beg God, Lord, help me quit. Let me lay it down. You did. How many? How often have you done that? Most folks beg God when they get caught, or it gets them in trouble. But buddy, when hey, I'm telling you, when somebody is sincere and honest with God, they can get their prayers answered. Amen. And then, last of all, listen. Before I get to the next point, it's prayer. You and God alone together. It produces humility. Humility is nothing more than somebody coming to the realization, I, I, I can't do this myself. It's too big, too hard. It's, I can't do it. So humility produces dependency. As long as, you think it, as long as you think you can do it, you have no humility. 
That leads to my last point, number three. Why do we need revival? God, Lord, send revival. Why, number one? Because God's people don't care. God's, that's, a, that's an inward condition. God's people don't call. That's an upward condition. That's prayer. And number three, God's people don't come. In other words, they don't come. They don't get involved. That's outwardly. That's outwardly. God's people just don't get involved. Do you know what's missing today? You know why revival's not coming? It's because there's no commitment from God's people. I want God in my life, but I don't want him, I don't want him to have all of it. I want to be saved, and I want to go to heaven, but I still want some say-so in my life. Are you listening? I tell you how committed you are. What does it take to keep you out of church? What does it take? Well, we got a lady in our church who who has got who's who, who's got cancer all over her neck and throat. She seldom misses. I call that commitment, don't you? Huh? I see a man sitting here in a wheelchair. I see commitment. I'm trying to say to you that that uh, we need revival is because God's people, mm, God's people aren't committed. I was talking with uh, uh, a preacher in one of these newfangled churches, and he 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 knew me, and he preached back there, yeah, and and, uh, and of course I don't know about the guy. But I know he pastors when he's new family. They have a church once a week. <laughs> okay. I said, I stand go, oh, he said, it's good. We having the best services and we the crowds are big. And I said, man, he said, I and he said, it's going real good. And uh, how big a crowd you got? He's oh, we're running 250, 300. I said, man, that's really good. Amen. Numerically, that's good. And I said, he said, and the folks seem excited for God. I said, really? He said, yeah. I said, Ask them to come back on Sunday night. And he looked at me, he said, what? If you're, so, if you're so sure that they're committed and good, ask them to come back on a Sunday evening service. But he said, we don't have a Sunday evening service. How about a midweek service? We don't have that either. Well, how do you know they're committed? I said, how about you all? All oh, the offerings are real good. I said, that's wonderful. I'm glad they are. But ask them to take on missionaries individually. You say they're committed. <laughs> Do you have a Sunday school? No. Do you have a choir? No. We have a five. We, I said, we, he said, we have a five-member band. Now, you, you, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is this. People today don't want to be committed. They don't want to be committed. No commitment for God's service. Uh, no doers of the word. I mean, we're living in a, in a, in a don't do it attitude. I want to come to church, but as long as it's just once a week and I, I want to give, I'm not going to tithe. And this other stuff, I don't know. Oh yeah, I'm telling you, God's people just don't come to the surface. And it all goes back to my first two points. They don't care. They don't call. They don't. And wh listen, where there's no communion in prayer, there's commitment vanishes. When there's no fellowship and communion in prayer with God, seeking God's face, you see, when, whenever a child of God, a Christian, gets along with God and gets in his presence and God reveals to them some things, they become committed then. You won't have to ask them to come to church. They'll knock the doors down to get here. You won't have to ask them to tithe. They'll, they'll love to give. You won't have to, have to ask them to go soul winning. I mean, every day they're looking for souls. Why? Because they've been along with him. And it doesn't matter what the preachers preach. It's the best thing in the world. They don't take everything personally. Oh, he offended me with that statement. Who is he aiming that at? <laughs> When you spend time alone with God and, and the man of God gets up and preaches, you'll say, preach on, preacher. Let her rip, preacher. Why? Because you've been alone with him. But you see, 
You take this morning's message about fathers. Don't you know there were some fathers sitting here saying, oh boy, oh boy, oh me. <laughs> I knew he was going to say it. I knew he was going, I knew he was going to call it. I knew that. You know why? It's because it's Father's Day. And don't we need more godly fathers? I figure if the only time some men are going to come, I'm going to load their wagon while they're here. I figure the only time some women are going to come, I'm going to load them up while they're here. Not, not, not at anybody individually. It's fact is, it's sad, isn't it? It's just sad that they don't care. It's sad. That was something else about the, the fellow whose wife played the organ. Said he loved her, do anything, to make her happy. Then turned right around and said, I ain't doing that. There's no commitment in that marriage. So people can say, I love God all they want to. But where there's no commit communion in prayer, commitment vanishes. You know, over in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, you have those seven churches, right? And the last church is the church of Laodicea. And each church, each church, from the first to the last, represents the church, the church dispensations from the time of Christ. And so you and I are living in the last day church age, the church of the Laodiceans. As you go back there and read that in chapter 3, in verses 14 through 20, you'll see that it was a church in need of a great revival. You'll see it very plainly. Matter of fact, that what they saw, the Bible, uh, in other words, they were, first of all, they were lukewarm. Is that not the church today? Not hot, not cold. And God says, because you're not hot or not cold, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. And that's not losing your salvation. That means God's sick of it. God is sick of people being double-minded, half-hearted, half-cold, half-hot. Nobody knows where you're staying. You're in the world one day and probably with God next day. They were lukewarm. And the Bible says they were increased with goods, had need of nothing. And that's a good description of the church today. Increase with good, have need of nothing. So when you got everything you need and the increase with goods, why would you pray and ask God? Are you listening? Well, I got it made. Boy, I got a recliner at home. I got a big 60-inch television. Hey, man, surround sound. Whoopee! I can sit home. I can turn on uh, any. I, I can find me a preacher on television. I ain't got to get up and go to church. I can kick back here and get me a glass of tea and a, and a, and a pimento cheese sandwich and, and have church right here in my living room. No commitment. The last day church. Yeah. Increase with good, have need of nothing. And... Uh, but you see, the greatest need we have is not padded pews and carpet and a PA system. The greatest need we have is not a air conditioning. The greatest need we have is God's presence. It's not, it's not more people we need. It's more God we need. We've got the whole thing wrong. We think, well, what can we do to increase our attendance? What can we do to get more people here? i tell you what you can do. Spend time alone with God. That's what you can do. That don't make sense. That's why the world ain't doing it. They were lukewarm and they were increased with good. But here's what God said about them. But God, here's what he saw. He said, thou art wretched. In my eyes, you're wretched. And miserable. Poor, blind, naked. God said, that's what I see. And that's what he sees today. This is the last day church age. And here's, here's what he said at the close of each church. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. That's the Holy Spirit. He's here tonight. We have his word, we have his spirit. And I tell you what God's looking for. He's looking for just a few who say, God, I need revival in my life. And revival is not a turning from sin per se, it's a returning to, returning to. Well, revival will never come 
until God's people return to their time of communion and fellowship with him. And that's when revival will come. It's when you and I return to our fellowship and communion with him, then we'll see revival. You know why? Because then we'll humble ourselves. And then we'll turn from our wicked ways. You're not going to be able, you're not going to, be able to turn from your wicked ways on your own strength. You must have the power of God. You must have his presence to turn from, to turn from your wicked ways. And if you'll spend time with him, you'll be more humble than you've ever been. You'll pray like never before. And you'll see God like you've never seen him before. Amen. You'll see him. He'll speak to your heart. He'll guide you. Will that not revive our spirit? That's what our text said. Revive our spirit and revive our heart. So revival is not so much a turning from as it is a turning, a, re, a returning to. Now here's my thought. Will you be a part of that remnant? Will you be willing to count the cost to see revival come in your life and come to this church? Would you? Would you be willing to say tonight, God, I need revival. Because, Lord, what the, is, if, if what the preacher said is true, and it's not an if, it is a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's the deal. Revival is you and I returning to him. In prayer and communion, that's it. And it's not so much prayer at church. People say, well, do you have a prayer room? We got a prayer room. We need to use it more, amen? But if all you can do is pray in the prayer room, that revival ain't gonna come by praying in the prayer room. It might, have, it might help the church service that night, but that's not gonna bring revival. Revival will come when God's people humble themselves, pray and seek his face. That's it. Would you do that? God's only looking for a handful. 10 or 12, 7, 8, 9, 10. He's looking for somebody who will say, I really want revival in my life and I want it in my church. It could begin with the youngest kids all the way up to the oldest member. But it's got to start somewhere. Let it start in me. Amen? So what is revival? It's not a returning from it's a returning to. Amen. Let's pray. Now, Holy Spirit, oh my. Please speak to hearts tonight, Lord, like you've spoken to mine. Wilt thou not revive us again, Lord? Would you? We sure need it. Our nation is desperate for a revival, but it'll never come until God's people recognize what the whole deal is. And Lord, that is us returning to you in a spirit of communion and fellowship, prayer, and pushing the world aside, pushing the world away, spending time with you. God, enable us, give us, Lord, tonight some people who with the help and grace of God said, Lord, I'll, do, I'll, I'll, I'll be involved in this. Lord, I need your help in my life. I want revival in my life, in my family. Please, God, give us some people who really want revival. In Jesus' name, I humbly pray. Amen and amen. Let's stand to our feet. Lord, send revival. Revival's not for lost people, it's for saved people. God's people. Very few committed, committed, saved people today. Really, really committed. The things of this earth and world distracted us kept us from getting in God's presence TV programs reading material so many other things just busy, busy, busy 
preaching, a lot, preaching, there's a lot going on. Yeah, most of it's not good either. Years ago, I went by to see a man invited to church. His wife was saved, but he wasn't. And his excuse for not coming, he had to water his tomato plants, water his garden. One man said, "I can't leave my I can't leave my pets alone alone. I can't leave my dog and cats by themselves." Recreation, hobbies, pleasures, all these can get in the way of your relationship with God. He's looking for somebody who will desire to spend time with Him. Right, praise God. Now, I hope tonight's message, some of you will determine I am going to get back in my prayer chamber and I'm going to get back in my Bible. I really want revival. See, when revival does come to a church or to a person, other things will begin to happen. Lost folks will begin to get saved. Backsliders will tend to come back to church. You know why? Because God says, I will hear your prayer. I'll heal your land. Amen. You want to see people saved in your family? Spend time alone with God. You want to see things pick up in church? Spend time alone with God. Amen. Do what you can. All right. Well, listen, I hope you have a great day, what's left of it, and a great week. We'll be back here on Wednesday at prayer meeting at 7 o'clock. Hope you'll be here. And don't forget, next Sunday now, our brother Beckham will be here preaching a revival and uh, might as well just hold on because he's coming. <laughs> and uh, I pray for Brother Benny. I, I, the other day he got in on Friday. His, his grandson graduated from special schooling he went to. He got in and went to that. Got over here about 7 or 8 o'clock and checked into the house. His truck's still over there. And uh, he said, Brother Baker, he said, uh, I got to be at the airport in the morning. I need a ride. I said, I'll take you. I'll drive you down there. He said, okay. He said, uh, I got He said, I, I got I to gotta leave here at 4 o'clock in the morning. So I had to get up at 3. And uh, here's, here's what I'm trying to say to you. He's tired. And he's hurt his shoulder doing something. And he's out there, and, and he couldn't even pick up a suitcase. And so I had to do all that for him, which I didn't mind. But I'm saying pray for him that God help him with his shoulder. It's hard to preach and move around when you've got a bad shoulder. So, so pray for Brother Benny this week. And he'll have a great meeting out there in the state of Washington, and then God will help him as he gets back here. On, he's getting back in Friday, Brother Tommy, and I told him you'd pick him up. Okay? I'm going to pick him up. 6.15 Friday afternoon. Wonderful time in Charleston. 6.15 Friday afternoon at the airport. You got to work? George, you want to ride with George? <laughs> Son, he will be prayed up. he ride with George. No, sir, I'll pick him up. Praise God. George ain't picking him up. He'll test, business. He'll test his faith to ride with George. Nobody rides with George anymore. Except God doesn't even get in the car with him anymore. He scared the Holy Spirit out of, out of the truck. God bless you. Good night.